Uh, good morning, I'm Jack Berryman, uh, the ACSM historian, and we're here this morning talking with uh, Sue Bloomfield uh, as part of ACSM's uh, Distinguished Leaders in Sports Medicine and Exercise Science. So, welcome. Thank you. Sue, good to see it's you. Pleasure to talk with you. Um, I wanted to start out with um, if you could tell us a little bit about your current position mm -hmm. academically and your your research and your teaching and your students and uh, that, okay. that, that's going to take big okay. that all day. I'll, yeah, uh, no, I'll, but I'll keep it the best you quick. can. <laughs> okay. And and if you're currently on any ACSM committees or or anything. Like okay. That. All right. Well, I am currently professor uh, in the Department of Health and Kinesiology at Texas A&M University. I've been there now coming up on 23 years. Um, I also serve part-time as an assistant provost in our Office of Graduate and Professional Studies. It's A&M's equivalent of a graduate school. Mm -hmm. We have a decentralized system. Um, so I, I also am director of my bone biology laboratory. I, I'm proud of our research program and uh, work with anywhere from two to six graduate students at a time. I'm very proud of my crew. Um, they've they've um, been my junior colleagues over the years. Sure. And, um, Are they all doctoral students? Oh, no, I've had some master's, some master's. students. Okay. One interesting um, example is Monica Hubel, who was my master's student mm -hmm. um, and did a project in actually looking at bone and muscle. She also worked with Gordon Warren um, in our department, but went on to much um, greater fame and now is uh, um, um, at Georgetown um, University and the Children's National Hospital wow. um, and doing going gangbusters. So I'm, I'm, I'm proud of them all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And are you, are, do you still teach or are yes. you just too busy? Uh, to well, yes. <laughs> With the administrative job, my teaching was reduced to one course per year. Yeah. Um, I typically taught senior level exercise physiology courses and um, graduate courses. Um, for a while, exercise in clinical populations. I have some clinical cardiac rehabilitation background um, decades ago. Um, graduate courses, seminars, um, seminar in bone biology. I'm also involved with a graduate training program in space life sciences, which oh. is an integrative or interdisciplinary program among three departments, um, nutrition and food science, our department, and nuclear engineering, which is where the radiation biologists oh, are. So this is a funded training program for doctoral students. Mm -hmm. And we have a few courses specific to that curriculum. Um, so the teaching has been scaled back the last four years, but yeah. um, I certainly still enjoy the interaction with students. Yeah, oh, that's nice. And then you also asked me about ACSM yeah, involvement. Yeah. Um, I'm not currently serving on any ACSM committees or um, boards or so forth. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I was, I think, recently rotated off the MSSC ed, um, as an um, editorial That's board. That's what I thought you were yeah. on that. Yeah, I just rotated off. Um, okay. I have previously served on the board of trustees. I was president of the Texas ACSM chapter. Mm -hmm. um, years back and, and still involved with chapter activities um, but um, and, and on the program committee for a while but but haven't been involved in the last my few first years ex experience with the chapters was the Texas chapter oh yeah and you I was won't told it's that. the <laughs> Texas chapter the Texas chapter yes <laughs> with yes. with Tinker and we're very uh, proud of uh, it and those guys so. yeah Tinker and, and Peter Raven and Bill Squires Bill were really Squires. the forces yeah, behind you, you starting guys that chapter have a great chapter down yeah. there we're proud uh, of it. Sue, I um, want to go back a little bit now to uh, where you grew up, um, okay. high school days, uh, do any sports? Um, mm. uh, where did you go off to college and your major and okay. grad school? And All right. Well, uh, I, I grew up, was born and raised in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Um, I was um, a very solid student, but also was um, a dedicated swimmer. But you're talking to somebody who's pre-Title IX baby here. Oh, yeah. There were Not no many high school sports for girls yep. in my high school, yep. much to my dismay. Mm -hmm. um, went off to the University of Wyoming to start my, my undergrad La Laramie? career. Laramie, yeah. Wyoming, yeah. one of the windiest, coldest spots in the country. <laughs> um, Realized quickly, if several of my high school teachers were right, that um, you're not going to be happy there. One said, <laughs> continually shaking, you're not going to. What I really needed was a more rigorous liberal arts institution. Oh, uh -huh. 
and had some letters back from a friend who was at Oberlin College in Ohio, a small liberal arts school sure. there. Um, sounded amazing to me. So I applied to that one school and a kind of tunnel vision, right? Could have, should have applied to multiple, but I was accepted, but on a wait list, so moved the middle of my sophomore year to Oberlin. One of my so best you transferred. life. Yeah, I transferred. Yeah, yeah. One of my best life decisions. Um, I, could, I was trying to decide between anthropology, English, and biology. You know, I, I thought all three were fascinating. Mm -hmm. But in the end, decided um, for biology. It seemed more practical. I didn't ever envision teaching, <laughs> so what would I do with English? But um, um, so finished a degree in biology at Oberlin. And there was my first opportunity. I'd always done age group swimming up till then. Oh, mm -hmm. um, but uh, first opportunity to compete with a women's team. So we're right, right the year oh, after thought. Title IX was passed. So this is mid-70s, I guess. Uh, yeah. Early, yeah, 1972, I transferred there. And so finally had a varsity women's team to compete with. So for my last two years, I was able to do varsity swimming. So you 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 graduated from Oberlin then in like 74 or mm -hmm. 5, yeah. Okay. 74. Yeah. Yep, and one of my fondest memories was um, I did qualify for nationals my wow. senior year. What it, what, now what this did, was in AIAW days. Yes, yeah, sure. Right, pre sure. the transition of women's um, yeah. collegiate sports to NC2A. Absolutely, yeah. And tiny Oberlin College and any other small school was competing against Arizona and, yeah. and Berk Stanford yeah. and the big powerhouses. Yeah. We were all in what one event? Meet. What did you swim? It, it was the 50 breaststroke. Wow. And I, I was a much stronger distance swimmer, so I, I don't know how I qualified in the 50, but but it was a thrill to go. It was yeah. at, I, at Penn State. I remember it to this day. Oh, that's where it yeah. was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, that was an adventure. And so it, that, that um, triggered... So the, this helps explain why I win in my senior year. Because mm -hmm. I didn't have a f firmly formulated career plan. I had no idea where I was going. Mm -hmm. I had a good biology major. I loved physiology. Okay, that was my favorite subject. And I discovered that there was a discipline called exercise physiology. Yeah. It was a revelation. Yeah. I went, wow. uh, traveled with a few friends to a, a conference at Temple University in Phil uh, Philly? Right? Yeah, it's in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, and it was a topic on the woman athlete, I think. You know. But So it was fascinating, and I thought, this is it. I found it. So I, I had planned that I wanted to take a year off. Interestingly, I spent that year off in a part of that year in Muncie, Indiana. My um, future husband at the time, who I'd met at Oberlin. Is that where Ball State is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I ended up, um, he was doing the master's program at Ball State uh -huh. University the year Bank Saltin did an oh uh, uh, in-stay residence there. Yeah. So it was an intensive 15-month master's program. It was and Costal there? Oh, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, was, yeah that right. was his program, yes. really. So, um, and, and your fiancé at the time. Yeah, yeah. and I, uh, I, we don't have time to go into how yeah. you met. <laughs> But that's okay. So yeah, so, you go to and I almost was a technician in Costel's lab, <laughs> but Bill Evans got the job. Oh, so, so Bill Evans got that job. I found some other work. I was taking other courses towards applying to graduate school. Mm -hmm. um, so at the end of that year, got married, and then both of us went, entered the graduate program in exercise physiology at the University of Iowa. Oh, and okay. Carl Gisolfi was my oh. advisor there. And of course, I had chances to interact with Charlie Tipton as well, yeah. as one of my major professors. Um, um, so your husband went there too. Yes. He Were went, you married then? Yes. Yeah. By the, we by that time we'd married and um, started um, our graduate careers at University of Iowa. And um, uh, interestingly, I. The, the primary assistantships offered to students were teaching assistantships, mm -hmm. right, in the physical activity program, like yeah. many. Mine was and it was, the same. at the time, it was a physical education program, sure. right? But I was there for the Gisolfi Tipton exercise physiology mm -hmm. program, and one of the strongest in the country. And, uh, but I had a teaching assistantship, and I got a picture this 105 pound pipsqueak biology major, right, who has never had any experience, I had coached swimming, but never had taught you know, other activities. Um, I had had one physical activity course in my undergraduate mm -hmm. career, so had no model. And it turned out to be an incredibly stressful experience for me, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, 
most of us are, get to graduate school, you're, success, you're used to being successful. Yeah. You're a successful student. And to do this teaching assistantship where I really felt I was floundering, very stressful. What did you have to teach? Uh, uh, are you ready? Beginning <laughs> golf. Oh, I, I had golfed, you know, 10 years earlier. I could do the basics. But beginning golf, cycling, and um, oh, wow. who knows what else. Mm -hmm. But it, it, uh, not it swimming, was tough. Not swimming, though. No. No, not my comfort zone. So for me, it was stressful enough. I, I and, and you know, as graduate students, it's funny. I see this sometimes in current graduate mm -hmm. students, but I clearly wasn't, think, I didn't sit down and have a real heart to heart with Dr. DeSalfi, um, who has it. I knew him then. Um, I simply said, um, I, I have to withdraw from this program. I can't do this teaching assistantship. I'm not doing it well. I can't. Do, I think I'm going to have to find something mm -hmm. else. And um, so I started exploring alternatives and had applied to the nursing school at the University of Iowa and was accepted when Carl Tosafi called me into his office and said, oh, I'm rather confused. You're, you're a good student. You're a really good student. And um, I understand you didn't like the teaching assistantship, but what? So what do you say about giving it a second try? And I'll I'll give you a quarter time research assistantship oh. to combine with you know quarter time teaching assistantship. Mm -hmm. And and um, but I need you to commit to the doctoral track to do this, mm -hmm. right? Very reasonable. And so I thought it over and thought, well, I should give this a second try. I mean, I loved the coursework. Yeah. I mean, I did. It was great. So so I embarked the second time around as a, a doctoral student. And um, for a number of reasons, um, my husband had um, uh, moved midstream to take a job in St. Louis, Missouri. And, and I, at the time, clearly wasn't convinced that I was going to do a research career. Um, uh, so after oh, two, two, uh, another couple years, finished a master's degree there and um, moved to St. Louis. and. Uh, um, but I, I owe Carl a huge debt of gratitude for bringing me back to the discipline. Yeah, I you could he really have gave me a great opportunity. Gone off on that other tangent. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> might have been a professor of nursing, but yeah. Uh, yes. So, but I, it, this is the discipline I love. So I was very happy so, to come back. So, uh, Sue, it, it, I think I know the answer. That must have been through Jasalfi and Tipton that you came into ACSM. Absolutely. Um, the very first research presentation I ever made right, was on the research we were working. We were doing invasive studies in rodents to look at the hypothalamic regulation of, uh, for, uh, uh, control of temperature regulation. And using an agent called apomorphine to stimulate certain pathways to look at the, the um, body temperature response. And so uh, just all he said, well, you should take this to the Midwest chapter of ACSM oh. to present, right? And if, if um, those over 60 will remember the days when you painstakingly handmade your graphs oh, and took yeah. camera copies yeah. of them and all. So, yeah, so, uh, yeah that's, that was my first exposure to ACSM and was involved with the Midwest chapter. And what for year years. was that again? Just to... Well, that would have been seven, um, let's see, about 77 okay. that I right. went to that first ACSM yeah. meeting in Traverse City. We always had some skiing on the side, so okay. went traveled in a big station wagon with Carl and several other students. So yeah, yeah. that's neat. That was great. So uh, you you go to St. Louis. Yes, and I ended up um, in work uh, by a stroke of great luck, working in the Applied Physiology Laboratories under Dr. John Hollis. Oh, gee. And this is when um, what Jim a great Hagberg spot. and Doug Seals and um, Wow. Jack Young and a number of other um, very bright postdocs, an Eddie Coyle, cast. Uh, were there. Right. So I worked four years as a research assistant in the lab. Wow. It was a great postmaster's experience. I learned a ton. Yeah, and I, I um, progressed from there to a, a, a teaching job, much to my surprise, at a small <laughs> college in, in Michigan, um, but decided after uh, three years there that I, I really did miss the research. So I decided mm -hmm. it was time to get my PhD and ended up at the Ohio State yes, University yes, yes. <laughs> where I worked with Dave, Dave, Lam oh, Dave Lamb okay. and um, Dave Lamb and uh, Rebecca Jackson, an endocrinologist in the medical school, were my co-advisors. So in the, in the bigger picture, you had quite a gap 
Mm -hmm. I had between, seven year gap between yeah, my master's Yeah, between your PhD. master, which is. Yeah, and for me, it was the right path because I wasn't committed to mm -hmm. a career in research when I left Iowa City. Um, really enjoyed doing the work though in yeah. the, the applied physiology labs at Washington University School of Medicine. Um, then I earned my teaching wings, you know, at this uh, Alma College in Alma, What were Michigan. you teaching? Oh boy, they were just transitioning from physical education to the more science-based sure. exercise science mm -hmm. and health management is what they called the major. Oh, mm -hmm. And I was teaching everything, biomechanics, <laughs> yeah. seven or eight different courses, wow. <laughs> and uh, maybe more, and I, six of them were new to the curriculum, so wow. I, I really um, uh, uh, I worked can't. very hard and was the swim coach. So <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, juggle 10 balls. I can job. imagine uh, Lamb was quite impressed with you coming there with that experience. Well, it in certainly St. Louis. gave me a big advantage. I mean, that was moving forward. Cutting yeah. edge stuff. Yeah, it was um, and I did really truly didn't appreciate the value of that till I well, till I started teaching and I could pull on that yeah. and, and teaching, yeah. but also um, as then working as a an older, more mature graduate student, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Starting at the age of gosh, I was close to 30. Wow. So, um, yeah, so I, I had, um, and I had a protracted time at Ohio State University because I started my family during those years and took a few short breaks along the way. Mm -hmm. So now have two uh, beautiful, ambitious, independent daughters. That's and not, um, any grand, grand not yet, not yet, yet. not yet. Um, but uh, the, the oldest just married a few months ago. Oh, so, okay. um, but uh, yeah, so I spent. Uh, it was a good six years at Ohio State. And and I so what, a lot. what what year did you finish your PhD? I graduated in 1992. Okay. Yeah. Had you in the interim then? I, I'm sure you had given plenty of papers at uh, ACSM and yeah. oh, regional yeah. chapters and yes. all well, that. Yes, continued to be active with the Midwest chapter and started attending the national meeting. Actually, I'd started attending the national meeting while I was working in the St. Louis labs. Oh, okay. So um, realized that, ah, you know, it, this would be a great meeting to go to and get involved with. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, I wasn't presenting research data till I was a PhD student at mm -hmm. Ohio State. Mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, we, we took our work both to the bone, because I was working in the area of, um, actually at that time, clinical research in bone um, health. We were going to the Bone and Mineral Research Society meetings as well as to American College of Sports Medicine. Mm -hmm. But um, this has always been my first professional home, yeah. uh, presenting research. So uh, what was your next stop after your PhD? So after my PhD, um, I considered at that time, you know, postdoctoral fellowships were getting to be more common, mm -hmm. right? Not de rigueur, but more common in mm -hmm. our field. And I had um, almost had one worked out with a very um, productive osteoporosis research center in, um, at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. But the funding for that did not come through. So plan B was looking at these visiting assistant professorships um, jobs or one year, what, what, what was open in the academic mm -hmm. market. So I moved back to the University of Iowa and oh. took a visiting assistant professorship there. It was a one year slot, but it was a wonderful opportunity because mm -hmm. there was a, a small to moderate teaching expectation. And it gave me time to work on um, learning some new research skills. I was trying to learn a bit about molecular biology techniques and, mm -hmm. um, and was able to put in an application to NSF uh, by the end of that year for a small kind of pilot grant for women scientists and landed that. Oh, and that made me much more great. competitive on the job market, which mm -hmm. is when, um, so at the end of that year, I interviewed at well, a number of institutions, but ended up at Texas A&M oh, University. Okay. And Bob Armstrong was the um, department head at the time. And uh, it, it, he seemed to be uh, wonderfully supported of junior faculty. Um, incredibly, I was the first faculty member hired at Texas A&M offered a startup package. You know, this oh, is the, nice. the monies to help support and get your, a research program up and running. For your lab? Is yes. that when you started your lab? Yes. So 1993. And um, by then, and, and then I, it was clear that I was coming into an area where there wasn't the mm, clinical research center that I'd had at Ohio State University. Mm -hmm. So at that time, I shifted to animal research oh. to, to answer the research questions I was interested in. in um, 
bone biology. And, and that was, it turned out to be an excellent choice. You're able to do many more invasive studies, get at um, mechanisms much but better. But with the animal. Yes, yeah. yes. So it's been rodent research since then. I see. Um, uh, but uh, it turned out to be a wonderful place to work. Did, did you overlap with Barb Drinkwater then? When she, because she was doing a lot of osteoporosis. Well, certainly here in, within ACSM, yeah. yes, and yeah. um, and in fact, um, she. There were several reasons I chose to switch to the the bone area when I started my PhD work, but one of them um, was her seminal publication in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1984 mm -hmm. that documented. Um, Surprise, stunningly low bone mineral density values in healthy 22-year-old wow. athletes at Stanford mm -hmm. and uh, who were amenorrheic. So there was this link between some change in reproductive function and bone mineral density and bone health. Mm -hmm. And um, so that really piqued my interest. Um, during my PhD years, I, I coordinated with the work um, um, Rebecca Jackson was doing in the medical school and we studied um, spinal cord injured individuals and whether active um, muscle contraction in those individuals with a kind of unique functional electrical stimulation treatment could reverse some of the very profound mm. disuse bone loss that those individuals experience. Mm -hmm. But, um, and that got me started on the major emphasis of my research career, which has been disuse bone loss. I see. Yeah, so okay. how we mitigate um, that. I keep seeing things about Texas A&M and their, um, is it the undergrads that are very active in the uh, sort of uh, fitness uh, on campus and the exercise and medicine campaign? Am I oh, well, getting um, mixed up? But I thought it not, was Texas A&M. In Penn State, I hear a lot about, and yes. your well, school was we one have, of them. I'm we have sure. one of the largest physical activity programs yeah. in the nation yeah, with a very professional it. staff. And we have a whole program on campus called Aggies Commit to Lifelong Learning, mm -hmm. and that may be tied up with this. I have not been directly involved yeah, with the effort involved, you're referring yeah. to, but yeah, we have, um, oh gosh, 12, 12 to 13,000 students per semester taking physical activity wow. courses that is a, run by a division of our department. Yeah, yeah. So um, I would not be surprised if some smart colleague of mine harnessed that <laughs> I, I, I think that's what it is. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we're, we're almost rapidly running out of time. I wondered if you could uh, maybe comment, uh, since you've been involved so, you know, over time on sort of where ACSM is now and where it's come from and maybe where you see it going. Oh. I mean, it, yeah. I, I think the one thing from your standpoint is, has been the continued emphasis on science. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and that's, that's the, real the important. the role that that has played. And yeah. of course, coming out of the Iowa tradition, you, yeah. you know it full well. Yes, uh, sure. Um, I come from the more basic science point yes. of view, yes. and uh, that's what I've dedicated my career to, but I'm very cognizant of the critical importance of all our basic science to the more applied science mm -hmm. and um, even behavioral science. You know, mm -hmm. How do we motivate people to exercise? Mm -hmm. And the critical value of physical activity to human health. And um, so I think it's essential to have an organization like ACSM that helps, that brings together, right? Yes. The basic scientists, mm -hmm. the applied scientists, the behavioral health people, the, the fitness practitioners to um, translate those basic science findings into something useful for yeah. the general population yeah. and to have those people talking to each other, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, boy, ACSM has grown gangbusters yeah. <laughs> since I've been involved, since Huge. the mid-70s. Yeah. Um, it's, it's quite a large organization. I very much appreciate that there has been a continued focus in the annual meetings on some basic science. Mm -hmm. And the, this meeting has been one of the best in years. For I mean, there's been many multiple sessions, parallel sessions I haven't been able to attend because yeah. um, so uh, it's... Uh, the, 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 this, we hear it all the time. The strength of ACSM is in its diversity yeah. and the fact that we're bringing the sports medicine docs, the um, 
for the practitioners, the, the basic scientists, mm -hmm. um, behavioral health educators, scientists, together, yeah. educators together. Yeah. Well, uh, one other question. Is there a separate national group that you also get involved with more specific to your research? Well, yeah, the American Society of Bone and Mineral Research I, I wonder, is, okay. is the okay. premier bone focused yeah, organization. Yeah, and so. so for someone in my field, it's really critical to get to those meetings. Sure. I'm sure you've heard this from other yeah. scientist um, members you've interviewed, uh, because of course those are the folks that you're either collaborating with or reviewing your grant proposals or mm -hmm. so forth. And um, it's a very rich, scientifically rich meeting. Um, so it, it's an important complement to what I do yeah. here at ACSM. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but my students continue to come to both meetings. Um, and I, I think what another huge value of ACSM, both to me and my research lab, but to, to all of our members, is the major emphasis on students. Yeah. In other words, and you may have caught this drift that the Texas chapter of ACSM is especially proud of mm -hmm. you know, the fact that we devote tens of thousands of dollars to student Mm -hmm. grants to student um, competitions yeah. um, so that is but that's also the emphasis at the national level it's much much harder um, at these other more basic science meetings in the specific disciplines for especially for undergrads to get involved oh, you'll see yeah. a smattering of doctoral students but it's mostly the postdoctoral fellows and full mm -hmm. investigators mm -hmm. at the, those other meetings so ACSM has been tremendous for student growth and development promoting them and giving them an opportunity to present nationally and uh, yeah. gain experience. And I appreciate things like the Research Foundation, which you know supports graduate student nice funding for their research as well. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Pleasure so talking to you, Jack. The uh, time just flies yeah. by. <laughs> it goes fast. <laughs>